All right, well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm here today with um, Major Crimes Division Commander Matt Clark, here to talk about uh, two critical incidents that both occurred on the same day, October 19th of uh, last week. Um, before I turn it over to Matt Clark, I just want to set the stage that uh, earlier today we provided the videos associated with both of these incidents, and we will now just uh, provide an overview based upon our follow-up investigation to this point. So thank you, Matt. All right, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Matt Clark, the commander of the Major Crimes Division for the Denver Police Department. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide an uh, update regarding two police shooting incidents that occurred on Thursday, uh, October 19th, 2023. These are intended to be follow-up briefings based upon information we've gathered after interviewing numerous witnesses, speaking with the involved officers, and analyzing evidence that was collected at the scene. Criminal charges are uh, currently pending in these cases, uh, so there may be information I'm not able to disclose, but to the degree we are able, we'll answer any qu excuse me, questions uh, at the conclusion here. Um, I'm gonna, we'll just go in chronological order. I'll start with the first incident that occurred uh, in the area of 46 North Avenue and York Street. On Thursday, October 19th, 2023, around 2.35 in the afternoon, the Denver uh, Communication Center received a 911 call from an individual who was reporting a male was in the area pointing a firearm at individuals. This was in the 3000 block of East 45th Avenue near the Burger King location. The complainant provided a description of the subject and that description was relayed to the responding officers. <clears throat> officers arrived in the area shortly after being dispatched uh, and contacted the victim. He specifically advised the officers that he was headed to the Burger King. He was driving west on 45th Avenue from Steele Street when he observed a male in front of him walking in the street slowly. The victim continued slowly driving behind the individual and intentionally did not engage him, did not honk at him or do anything to get his attention. At one point, the subject turned around towards the victim while he's driving the vehicle and pointed a firearm directly at him. Uh, the subject then quickly turned around and began continuing westbound again on 45th Avenue. He was also seen pointing a firearm in the uh, Burger King or towards the Burger King location on uh, 45th Avenue there. While officers were in contact with the victim, a separate officer who responded uh, to assist in checking the area was in plain clothes, driving an unmarked vehicle and located an individual matching the subject's description near the area of 45th Avenue and Josephine Street. The officer began monitoring the suspect while waiting for additional information from the officers who were with the victim. At one point, the undercover officer who was in his vehicle uh, observed the subject retrieve a firearm from a bag or backpack that he was carrying. While holding the firearm in his right hand, the subject directed his attention towards the undercover officer and began walking towards his vehicle. The subject stopped several feet from the driver's door of the undercover vehicle. The plainclothes officer was specifically concerned that he would be shot in his vehicle by this individual. Uh, so he exited his vehicle, drew his firearm, and identified himself as a police officer. Despite being in plain clothes, the officer was wearing a tactical vest over his outer layer of clothing, which had police insignia that identified him as a police officer. The officer gave specific commands to drop the firearm, which were ignored. The subject turned around from the officer and walked away uh, still holding the firearm in his right hand. Uniformed officers in three separate marked vehicles quickly arrived to provide assistance. Officers followed the subject as he walked northbound on Josephine Street from 46 South Avenue. Now Josephine Street in that area goes over the below grade section of I-70 and this particular portion is bordered by 46 South Avenue and 46 North Avenue. While officers were behind the subject uh, continually they continued to direct him to drop the firearm that he was holding. The subject disregarded these commands and continued northbound. When he reached 46 North Avenue, the subject went westbound and started yelling at officers to shoot me, shoot me. Despite the lack of a suitable barrier to protect the officers, they continued following the subject while attempting to gain his compliance. This included verbal communication by the officers with specific commands, as well as efforts to determine if he needed assistance. Officers were aware that he had pointed a firearm at the original victim and were concerned for safety of the people in the area if he would be allowed to continue without them maintaining a close visual proximity. 
The subject continued moving westbound in the middle of 46th Avenue North. He was facing away from the, or excuse me, he was facing the officers as he walked backwards away from them on 46th Avenue North towards York Street. At this point, there were five officers, including the undercover detective, uh, four others who were in uniform in the area um, following the subject as he moved down 46th Avenue North. The officers estimated they were approximately 30 yards from the subject while he was walking away. When the subject began walking into the intersection of 46 North Avenue and York Street, he stopped briefly and raised the gun before quickly lowering it. A few seconds later, the suspect raised his right hand, which had the gun, and he pointed the firearm directly at the officers in the roadway. The officers feared he was preparing to shoot at them, and they discharged their firearms. The officers stopped firing their weapons when they believed the subject was no longer posing a deadly threat. The subject was struck and fell to the ground. Officers immediately called for an ambulance to respond and quickly began life-saving efforts, and that included the application of a tourniquet and the use of uh, medical gauze pads to control the bleeding until the paramedics arrived. The subject was transported to the hospital by ambulance, uh, and he continues to remain at the hospital receiving treatment for his injuries. Uh, he is expected to survive. Through the investigation, it was determined that four Denver police officers fired a total of 12 rounds from their duty handgun. The closest officer was approximately 59 feet away from the individual uh, when shots were fired, and the furthest officer was about 72 feet away. Investigators recovered a black CO2 gun that is capable of firing BB or pellet type projectiles. Uh, that that uh, gun was on the ground near the location where the subject was apprehended. The black gun closely resembles a semi-automatic firearm. This is the gun the subject held throughout the interaction with officers. Investigators interviewed the original 911 caller as well as another individual who reported that the subject pointed the firearm at him. The second victim told investigators that he was sitting inside of the Burger King restaurant on 45th Avenue. Uh, he was at a table that was adjacent to the window on the 45th Avenue side and explained that the male subject was on the sidewalk, pointed the firearm uh, at him in his seat, and began firing. He discharged that weapon uh, several times. Uh, the projectiles that were fired did not penetrate the glass or window frame, but did leave defects in both. The subject has been identified as 36-year-old Ruben Sayanez, S-A-E-N-Z. Preliminary ind information indicates Mr. Sayanez was struck multiple times. He was hit in the arm and the torso. The district attorney's office has, for, has formally charged Mr. Sayanez with seven counts of felony menacing. As it relates to the officers, the officers who discharged their weapons uh, in this incident are all assigned to the District 2 station, which is in Northeast Denver. The plainclothes officer is a detective in the District 2 Narcotics Unit. He's been with the department for 30 years and was involved in a prior police shooting incident in 1997. The three uniformed officers are also assigned to District 2 in the Patrol Division. One has been with the department since 2019. He was involved in a prior police shooting incident in 2021. The other two have been with the department since 2022 and have not been involved in a prior incident. The officer's body-worn cameras were activated and captured the shooting incident. The involved officers will be placed uh, in a modified duty status as they complete the department's reintegration program. Um, let me go through a couple slides regarding this uh, particular incident, and then we'll answer any questions. So these will be clips from the body-worn cameras. Uh, the department has released uh, their clips from the body-worn cameras that were released. And uh, so if you choose not to watch the body camera or just for reference, I'll show. Um, maybe. Thank you. All right. So we're on the corner of 46 North Avenue and Josephine Street at this point. Um, and the officers are um, approaching him, trying to give him commands. As you can see, he's got a, he's holding the firearm pointed at the ground in this picture with a pistol type grip um, uh, on his right side. The next photo is on 46 North Avenue. Uh, he is facing officers, walking backwards. He's walking westbound. This road, if you continue straight, will uh, provide an on-ramp to westbound I-70, which is below grade. Um, and again, the firearm remains uh, in his right hand there. This is just prior to uh, frame, a couple frames before shots are fired by officers, uh, Mr. Sayanez has raised his arm. He's holding it up. Um, he has not lowered it like he did previously, and the officers fear he's going to fire, and they discharge their weapons at this point. 
This is a photograph from the Burger King location where we had a victim sitting at the booth table inside the location there. There's six defects visible, three in the glass and three in the window frame. This is a crime scene photograph of the recovered uh, CO2 firearm that appears similar to a semi-automatic firearm that uh, Mr. Sain has possessed throughout his interaction with the officers. Any questions? We had a dog with them in the video. Um, yes, ma'am. Wanted to know, was that his dog and um, what happened to his dog? So uh, the dog it was not his dog. The dog belonged to um, an ex-girlfriend of his who lives in southern Colorado. The dog's name is Stallone, and we're able to report that uh, Stallone was reunited with the owner. Can you take us through the dissonance in some of the commands? You see the officers approaching him down the street, one officer saying, I'm going to help you, and seconds later another officer says, I'm going to shoot you. Is, is that part of training with the operation? Do you, do you work to kind of try to mitigate to the degree they're able to, they, the best approach tactically is to have one individual communicating um, with, with the subject so that we're not giving multiple commands, we're not giving contradictory commands or, or um, giving different direction potentially. But uh, the officers explained that they had specific concerns that they were trying to communicate. Um, there was certainly a recognition and an effort to try to um, see what, what's your name, what, what do you need, that type of thing, how can we help you, um, while at the same time trying to gain compliance and, and have him drop that firearm that posed an immediate threat. Uh, how many times he was shot? Uh, multiple. I don't. Um, I, I know he was, was hit multiple times, and it's an arm and torso injuries. I know you said in the hospital still, but is there a condition at this point? I, I'm, I'm just, uh, the last I was told that he's survivable, I, I, I don't have a specific condition. I, I know he's stable at the hospital. I think it's very difficult the way that some of these firearms are made to try and make, there's no, sometimes there's no distinguishing other than what the actual projectile that comes out of the weapon is. I'll move on to the next uh, incident. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a timeline on the internal and DA's investigation? Um, the, D, the district attorneys filed the criminal case against Mr. Sayanez. Um, the investigators will turn over the case for their consideration. I don't have a timeline on what that looks like in terms of their review, but once the, that review is completed, it will come back to the department and then the administrative will start at that point. Thank you. All right. Uh, later the same day, on Thursday, October 19, 2023, around 615, there were four uniformed Denver police officers who were working in an off-duty capacity at the Whole Foods grocery store in the 1700 block of Owada Street. The off-duty officers were hired by the business to provide uh, specific police presence in the store and to be available to handle any issues that occurred at the location. At around 6.15, one of the officers who was positioned on the lower level of the store observed a male enter the business through the Wawada Street entrance. The male caught the officer's attention because he appeared out of it. The officer greeted the male, but did not receive a response and the male continued walking past. The officer had no further interaction with him at this point and continued his activities monitoring the store. At 6.17, store surveillance captured the male walking behind the deli counter which is on the Wawada side of the store. Uh, while employees were in the area, the subject grabbed a large butcher-style knife that was, in the food, uh, that was near a food prepar uh, preparation station in the deli. Two store employees observed this and frantically waved to that same officer to get his attention. The employees indicated they needed the officer to come over for assistance. The officer went to the area and saw the male subject now standing outside in the customer area in front of the deli counter holding a, a, the butcher style knife uh, in his right hand by his side. The officer notified the other uniformed officers that were present that he needed assistance and they all quickly came um, to the area. With four officers present, one of the officers began calmly communicating with the subject to gain his compliance and peacefully resolve the situation. 
The subject generally remained in the same area while continuing to hold the knife at his side on, at times in front of him. At times it was recognized that he pointed the tip of the knife into his chest and even was pushing in. Uh, and then he would move it back to in, in front of him. At 624, the subject again went behind the counter and switched the knife that he was holding. He put the butcher knife down and grabbed a different knife, which was a 13 inch um, kitchen serrated blade type knife. The officers worked to communicate with the subject for nearly 12 minutes. And during that time, an officer attempted to engage the suspect in a dialogue, subject in a dialogue to understand the situation and his needs. He was offered food, a place to stay. He was offered access to a hospital, money, an opportunity to charge a cell phone. And this was all done in an intentional effort to de-escalate and safely resolve the incident. Other officers who were present um, were simultaneously working to um, clear the area of any customers or employees that were still there. Throughout the incident, the subject remained non-compliant and did not engage in a dialogue with the officers. Recognizing the individual was possibly suffering from a mental health episode, the officers requested available on-duty mental health resources respond to the location. The way this situation developed, however, was quicker than the resources were able to respond to the location. So there were no mental health conditions uh, at the scene at the time. Additional on-duty uniformed officers were notified of the incident via the police radio and responded to provide assistance. Several less lethal systems were available inside the store, including taser devices and a 40 millimeter less lethal sponge round launcher. After nearly 12 minutes of unfruitful communication efforts, officers described seeing the male begin to move towards the location of uniformed officers who were positioned in the bakery area. While he previously moved slowly and would stay relatively in the same location, this was different and the officers recognized he seemed intentional in his movement as he began uh, directing towards these officers. Fearing he may be preparing to use the knife to assault an officer, one officer discharged a taser and another officer discharged a firearm. <clears throat> this occurred nearly simultaneously. The round fired by the officer did not impact the subject. The taser was effective and it allowed officers to safely take the individual into custody. He was then transported to an area hospital uh, for evaluation and once medically cleared, um, was held for investigation of felony menacing. Through the investigation, it was determined that one Denver police officer fired one round from her duty handgun. The round impacted the front facing glass of a, and, and the side panel of a freezer that was directly behind the subject. Investigators recovered a 13 inch knife with a serrated blade on the ground near the location where the subject was taken into custody. This knife uh, was one that belonged to the store. It was uh, one that was previously in the uh, deli preparation area. The subject has been identified as 33 year old Latif Robinson. Uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, is currently being held for investigation of felony menacing, but we are working with the district attorney's office as well as our internal mental health resources and well power to determine what mental health treatment options are available for him. The officer who discharged her firearm is assigned to the department's recruitment unit. She's been with the department since 2020 and has not been involved in a prior police shooting incident. Her uh, body worn camera and those that of the other officers were activated at the time and did capture the interaction with Mr. Robinson as well as the weapon discharge. And the officer involved in this will be in a modified duty status as she completes the reintegration program. This investigation and the prior are being conducted in accordance with our critical incident protocol uh, with involvement from the Colorado Bureau of Investigations, the Colorado State Patrol and the Denver Police Homicide Unit and the Denver District Attorney's Office. The investigation is monitored by the Office of the Independent Monitor. Anyone with information on either incident uh, that we haven't spoken to or has additional information or video, we'd request that they contact the Denver Police Department or Crime Stoppers. I'll conclude with that and just briefly jump through the slides and then answer any questions you may have. This is um, in front of the deli of uh, Whole Foods. We're on the Wawada Street side. Um, Behind the officer is the Wawada Street entrance. In front of the officer is the area of the bakery. And at this point, we see Mr. Robinson uh, with the butcher knife. He's just come out from behind the counter uh, and he's holding it in his left hand. He switches the knife. It's now uh, in this frame, a uh, little time later, he's moved to his right hand. 
and this is again he generally stays in, in the same area he moves around slowly nothing um, purposeful uh, with that and he, but he eventually makes his way back and he's back against the uh, freezer area and the bakery <clears throat> you have officers still in front of the, the deli area and then officers in front of the bakery trying to address him he's got the knife in his right hand at this point and then this is just prior to the shot being fired. The officer who deploys a taser, um, and then this is the view from the officer who fired her weapon that, as Mr. Robinson has now turned and made movements towards uh, their, their position there. The uh, freezer that is hit is the far back uh, door. It's hit by the gun, the round that's fired. This is a photograph of the knife that was recovered that he was holding as he's standing in front of those those freezers. Any questions on that incident? Is there any calculation with that type of knife? Knowing the butcher knife, the like stabbing capability, that one is more serrated and kind of dull on the edge. Is that taken into consideration when you're looking at a situation like this? Um, I, I think that's still would still be a deadly weapon um, and the officers would respond whether it's the butcher knife or that one that could cause significant injury or death to somebody I know it happens quickly with those the taser and then the gunshot um, when you look we freeze frame when the gunshot happened there is no officer near the, the person so do we know why she shot um, the officer explained uh, she was concerned about other officers who were nearby her. Uh, it may appear there's a significant distance, but it is closer than it probably appears on the camera there. Uh, and so she's concerned for her safety, specifically she articulated, as well as the other officers who were present. Tactically, I know in these situations, typically time and distance is what you want in a situation where someone has a time. If they are that close, should they have been further back? Th there's a, a, a number of options, and some of the concerns that the officers articulated was, while the area in front of them appears clear, there are still customers and people moving about the store that didn't heed the immediate warnings to, to leave the area. Um, and there's also concern of people in the bakery area. Um, and it's, it's not visible unless you look from the camera from the Wawada entrance, but there's a pass through into the back, the employee part of the bakery too, um, that there was concern that there was people there. So the officers maintained that proximity to, to contain him is what they described, um, but to also protect and provide a barrier for others that were still in the store. And the split second use of the taser and the gun at the same time, do you usually wait to see if the taser is effective? I mean, I hear that officer asking the other officer to have the taser cocked and ready. Is there a moment where you wait and say, some situations yield to that. This, the officer specifically described um, that she felt at that point that this was a deadly force situation, that somebody was going to get uh, injured or killed if she didn't um, utilize the, the weapon system that she had available, and that was her firearm. Reintegration is uh, something that the department's done for several years, and we piloted it. It's been mirrored around the country. It's a, it's a um, rather robust officer-centric process to um, give the officers what we refer to as a tactical pause. It takes them offline. It provides intentional um, outreach and contact with the officer. They go through a police psychologist um, connection and, and uh, conversations. They'll go through um, decisional shooting scenarios with our virtual simulators, and they'll get a series of different um, scenarios in increasing complexity so that the department can assess their reaction to those scenarios. They'll go through live fire training at our range. Similarly, um, increasingly complex scenarios. Um, they will go uh, through, they'll work through different things at the academy. The academy will address any needs that they have um, in terms of processing the trauma that they've been through, um, helping their family. They return to the scene, which is an important aspect, take them back to the scene in a controlled environment so that we can see how they're responding to that, that scenario as well. Uh, and then they transition back into the district. So it's just it, it, uh, a consistent process that the department uses when somebody discharges their firearm um, so that we can make sure that the officer is healthy and ready to go back and everybody's comfortable with that. 
uh, at least eight weeks, typically. Uh, it can go longer. Again, it's officer kind of dependent, so some officers need more time, and, and the, that's flex the flexibility is there to allow that. Is there any ability to either, either of these incidents could have been a suicide by cop situation? I don't know, Chief, you want to address? You know, we may never know the answer to that question. I mean, I think, I think certainly um, uh, one could think that uh, that you know, confronting an officer with um, you know with a, with something that's actually not a not a, a handgun uh, could you know could uh, lead to that to that thought process. Um, uh, who knows? You know what a particular mental health crisis this other individual with the knife was was going through. Certainly, was not our intention in either one of those incidents to have to use force, but. Uh, you know, I think the you know the best outcome in both of those situations would have been for them to uh, to drop the objects that they had in their hand. Is there a vulnerability in the SCAR program here? I know that if no one was around nearby to respond, this would take a lot of time. Well, so this would this neither one of these situations would have been appropriate for STAR because of the arm component there. So, you know, uh, STAR is specifically reserved for situations where there was no one who who is armed with uh, with a weapon. Since we're only talking about paramedics and and, and mental health clinicians, can they work in cohort with your officers? On the so, um, what is probably more appropriate, if available, for a situation like this would be a co-responder. So these are uh, mental health clinicians that ride alongside police officers. Um, it just so happened in the first incident that none of the officers that were first to respond had a co-responder with them. Uh, this other incident um, that happened with the four officers that were assigned to that store, um, you know, there was no clinician that was assigned to, to, to work that store. Certainly, um, if there were was a co-responder that was available that could have gotten there in time for, you know, for them to intervene, then that would have been the best situation. Forgive me if I missed this, but was there a criminal history for either of these guys? So we don't, we don't address criminal histories in these types of scenarios. Certainly, we provided the information about who the individuals are. Uh, your birth dates. I'll make sure the media relations team has that. Do either of these subjects have a home address? Are they, could they be considered homeless people? Uh, I, I, I don't believe that these individuals were unhoused. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not positive, but from what I have heard so far, I don't believe it to be unhoused. This is the second time in four months we've been here to talk about two incidents in a, in a day involving uh, officers shooting with firearms. And I know that um, probably couldn't be avoided in these situations, but it's hard to ignore that these things are kind of stacking up. Certainly a concern. You know, certainly a concern. Um, I don't think that it's uh, anything that any officer looks forward to doing, having to having to use force. Um, but I trust that the women and men that go out and perform this job every day do so um, with with the intention to, to protect the community. So, are assaults on officer rising? Um, I don't know that that's something that we're necessarily seeing. I mean, what, I, what we are seeing is more armed individuals, um, um, and so we certainly have opportunity to contact more armed individuals, certainly we recover, you know, I think, I think we're up to about 1,800 illegal firearms recovered thus far this year, uh, more than any other year previously. And, you know, thankfully, um, the overwhelming majority of those incidents um, uh, are, are managed without anybody having to use force. Chief, I'd like to get your uh, input on Katie's question originally about the idea of these weapons that look like mm -hmm. Well, it certainly poses a danger because they do look like real weapons, and I don't think it's reasonable for us to be able to try to make that distinction. You know, I, th I think that there's sometimes uh, um, we're unable to make that distinction, even if we were to see a side-by-side -side comparison. So, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, obviously I'm not going to be the one that makes that legal determination. It's going to be the district attorney, but certainly I think that it's appropriate for an officer who <laughs> believes that they are uh, being threatened by a deadly weapon to respond with, you know, with force. There's no markings on these <clears throat> guns, no orange paint or anything. Um, no, I mean, as I think you saw, there was no like orange tip on this. I think if you were to take a close look at the at this weapon, you would have seen, you know, something on the grip that looked like not something that you would typically see on a firearm. But as he's, you know, holding it in his fist, that's not something you'd be able to see. Nor would you be able to see the cartridge that's inside. 
Excuse me? Is that on the manufacturer to make these weapons? Should they be taking more precautions to make them look like safe weapons? Well, certainly a concern of mine. Uh, and I would imagine a public concern as well when, when we have people that are uh, carrying around implements that look very much like real weapons. I think, you know, um, not only was it those police officers who felt threatened by that weapon, it was the individual inside of the Kings, or inside of the uh, Burger King, excuse me, and, and others in the neighborhood that also felt as though uh, they were in danger from this individual. Not only are there more real guns probably than ever on the streets, we have fake guns that look like real guns. And I would imagine they go hand in hand. I would imagine that because there are individuals who feel threatened by the fact that there is an overwhelming presence of real handguns, that um, if they can't get their hands on a real handgun, maybe, maybe they can defend themselves with something that's not a real handgun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you, Chief.